I'm going to talk about divergent series. And uh, I will introduce uh, uh, that with some uh, general remarks. Infinite series are uh, the basis for a wide class of approximations in uh, mathematics and physics. We all know this. Uh, you make an approximation and you improve it and you improve it. You know, one of the ways of improving is to have a series. Another way is iteration or renormalization, but today it's series. Now, most series are divergent. I hope I'll convince you of that and you'll understand why by the time I, uh, I have finished. And divergent series are the deepest area of asymptotics. Asymptotics is the study of limits. And uh, limits in physics are usually singular. They're not just straightforward convergent Taylor expansions. And the singularness is part of the reason uh, for the divergence. And as some philosophical remarks, singular limits are at the heart of relations between physical theories at different levels, classical to quantum, uh, Navier-Stokes with uh, viscosity and Euler without viscosity, um, large N statistical mechanics has, uh, has as its limit uh, 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 classical thermodynamics and so on. And that's this fact that these limits which take you in physics from one level to another is something which uh, the philosophers who discuss emergence and uh, inter-theory relations ignore. And it's a very a crucial element that they, that they, they shouldn't ignore. And I've written extensively about this. Now, understanding divergence has been a thread running through mathematics for several centuries. And the subject has been repeatedly reborn more deeply each time, and it's happening again now. OK. So let's go back to uh, 1647. Thomas Bayes, we know him better for his Bayesian statistics, very popular uh, now. But this is something else. And if you're interested in how I discovered what I'm going to tell you, uh, ask me afterwards. It's an amusing story. Um, well, this is how you submitted a paper in those days. In fact, you know, Institute of Physics in, in the UK say that they would still accept a handwritten paper. I don't know when the last time was they received one, but uh, that's what they said. And, uh, well, here's the... It, it wasn't published, by the way, till after he died in 1763. And he said... We don't know why there was a delay. If the following observations do not seem to you to be too minute, I would esteem it as a favour if you would please communicate them to the Royal Society. And what he discovered was that a series commonly used in uh, mathematics uh, is divergent. And he was very puzzled by this. Uh, so he, he, here we are. Um, is it, but the whole series can never properly express any quantity at all because after the fifth term, it needn't be the fifth, the coefficients begin to increase and they afterwards increase at a greater rate than what can be compensated by the increase of the powers of z, that's the variable, though z represent a number ever so large. So what he discovered was that Stirling's formula for the gamma function, the logarithm of it, and here it is, logarithm with some stuff subtracted is this series, is divergent. And he discovered that it's factorially divergent. Here's this factorial here which dominates. You can easily see that. I've chosen here z, z, I should say, equals 3. And uh, you see that it diverges after about the ninth, eighth or ninth term. It's actually a reasonable approximation, even for log of factorial 1, which, of course, is 0. And here you see that uh, the terms, uh, the first two terms get smaller. Between 2 and 3, they start to increase, and then they get bigger. This You will see this over and over again. Now, in between... Bayes' uh, observation and bewilderment and its publication, Euler wrote much deep, more deeply and extensively about divergent series. And he took them seriously. He wasn't disturbed at all. He said, OK, they're coded representations of functions. And, uh, you know, in some favorable cases, you can decode various um, uh, various uh, 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 approximation schemes for, or, or interpretation schemes for series, not these factorially divergent, but other ones. Very deep, beautiful uh, work. 
But it wasn't, uh, wasn't always the case. I mean, Abel, 1826, divergent series of the invention of the devil, and it's shameful to base on them any demonstration whatsoever. And then to descend to the ridiculous, there's this uh, mythical, I'm sure, um, graffito on a wall in a men's room in Princeton. Two plus two equals five for sufficiently large values of two. Okay. Well, the next serious step evolved from some work by George Airy, the Astronomer Royal. He was building on what Thomas Young uh, had discovered, uh, in interference, and Thomas Young had given as one of his examples interference fringes that you see in rainbows under suitable conditions when decoherence is not, uh, is, is, is not a problem. And he realised, Airy, that he was doing something fundamental. He was looking at the new theory, wave physics, near the singularities of the old theory, which is geometrical optics, ray theory. And, the, and of course, the rainbow is an example, but he realised, as I say, he was doing something general. And uh, in terms of the rainbow crossing variable, he invented what we now call the Airy function. It's a function of rainbow crossing variable uh, z. There it is. You can move the contour a bit, and it's a nice convergent integral. But we well, we know how to uh, what this function looks like. You just call it up in Mathematica, just like sines and cosines, whatever. Um, Airy was disappointed that he couldn't compute his function except in a rather small region uh, near the origin. There's a convergent series he could use for that. And he was disappointed because if you square it up, it just describes the first two intensity maxima. And experiments have been done on globes of water, artificial rainbows. People had measured about 30 of these fringes, and Airy couldn't, couldn't uh, compare his theory with the experiment because he couldn't calculate the function. So. The first real hero of this story is uh, Stokes, 10 years later. And he found asymptotic approximations for the Airy function. And then here they are. On the dark side, exponential decay. And on the bright side, uh, this uh, oscillation, the, the cosine with the correct phase. And now we know it's a geometric phase. That's another story. Um, he found this. Now, he also realized that these were the first terms of infinite series. And on the dark side, uh, here it is. And the reason for this rather strange way of writing a small exponential will emerge later. But here's a series, and he realizes it's a divergent series. It's factorial divergence again. Here's, uh, I can't remember what the variable is, but, uh, but here's, uh, here are the first terms. They decrease, and then the factorial takes over, and then they increase. Now, the least term is where? Is, is, is n, that's the order of the term, equals this, uh, uh, this exponent here, f. Good. Actually, uh, never mind. It, it, he re he realised that. Now, just a remark. He pre-invented WKB theory in order to get the, this approximation on, on, on the dark side, exponential decay. He realised that Airy's function satisfies a differential equation. And on the bright side with the cosine, he pre-invented the method of stationary phase. Uh, without fanfare, these were sort of buried away in his calculations, but he was a very original person. Now, any other lesser scientist would have been very happy at uh, what I've just explained, he did. But Stokes was much deeper. He realized that there's a puzzle. Here is a function. On one side, it has one exponential. On the other side, there are two because of the cosine. Right. Well, well what are they? Uh, one exponential, call it E1, uh, this n small exponential, f is negative here. And the other is E2. But that only exists on the bright side. So what, what happens? I mean, where does this second exponential come from? Well, he realized that if you go around in the complex plane, uh, from the bright side, the dark side to the bright side, that this second exponential must appear, I'll explain why in a minute, over a certain line here. Now that line uh, uh, has the property that uh, this f is positive real, so what was a small exponential here has come, become a big exponential. And the new exponential is actually 
very small at this place, and it, it sneaks in, hidden behind the large one. And then, of course, as you go round to the uh, negative axis, they both become of equal magnitude. They interfere, and you get the cosine, the oscillations. So it's born where it's maximally dominated uh, by the other exponential that uh, is, is then large. Now, he tested this numerically, and I've recalculated exactly what he calculated with great difficulty for him, but because it's easy for us. And it's this. Take z equals 4, f equals 11, 11 terms in, 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 in the series. Right, so he chose this point. Here's the exact. He could just calculate it using the convergence series with great difficulty. And here's the asymptotic series for the first exponent down to its smallest term, and you get six-digit accuracy. Then you go on the other side, symmetrically, and uh, the exact, it has a number you calculate. The first series, um, uh, this exponential that's continued, um, well, it uh, only gives you three-digit accuracy. But if you include this subdominant, this small exponential, then uh, uh, and, and, and you add it to what you had from, from, from the first one, you again get six-digit accuracy. His demonstration that you really need this, and it happens across a Stokes line. Very lovely thing. Now, this is the quietly beating heart of asymptotics. It's called the Stokes phenomenon, many of you will know. And it's a sudden appearance of a small exponential while hidden behind a large one, going from the dark to the bright, sort of behind the rainbow, if you like, without passing the origin in a complex plane. It occurs throughout asymptotics in integrals, differential equations, integral equations, difference equations, series, also nor near more general types of caustic. And I'll just illustrate that. So here's a... A, a, a pattern of caustics produced by shining light through bathroom window glass. And uh, this is a smooth caustic. It's called the fold in the language of catastrophe theory, which classifies these shapes, um, which I've just shown you, airy function across. But then here's the cusp caustic. The, it's the Piercy function. And this integral, function of two variables, x and y, and here they are. And... Uh, uh, and, and, uh, I'm sorry, I use here now u and v, but it's the same. It's Excuse me, it's x and y. Good. And, and there's the intensity. Now, for the airy, the Stokes set, where small x appears, occurs in the complex plane. So you go from, uh, uh, of, of the parameter, one complex wave becomes two complex, another one reappears, and they're, they're real on the, um, on the negative axis. That's the, that's the cosine. Now, um, in the case of uh, higher catastrophes, you can get the Stokes phenomenon for real parameters. So this is Francis Wright's calculation. Here's a cusp, uh, ten, and, and here, on the other side, is, are, are the Stokes uh, lines across which you get small exponentials appearing. And you can do that for, I'll just show you, for, for three more singularities, which live in three dimensions, and so these are our surfaces. Um, there's the swallowtail, the elliptic umbilic, and the hyperbolic umbilic. And these um, grey uh, uh, surfaces are the caustics, and the culled ones sprouting out from them are the stoke sets across which small exponentials appear. When you calculate these um, functions, you compute them, which you need to do for various purposes, um, you need to take account of these Stokes uh, phenomena. Good. And it's with Christopher Howells. Now, there are two contrasting general phenomena. If you imagine a function which has exponents, i times phi, so phi is a phase, uh, the bifurcation set is where, for example, saddle points, is where saddle points coincide. And two, for example, real ones, two real ones coincide and become one evanescent wave. And it's, it's where the phase is stationary, there's saddle points, but to higher order. And this is the violent birth and death of real waves across these courses, which are the dominant features. But uh, the Stokes set is a, a much gentler thing, as I've just described. It happens sort of quietly. And uh, it, it, it's a non-local bifurcation. It means that uh, at two saddles, the conditions are such that the phases are the same, so that the imaginary parts, which correspond to real exponents, are maximally disparate, and that's the hiding of the, of the small behind the big. OK. Um, now, his argument, Stokes, was this. 
the best you can do with one of these divergent series is to go to the least term and then stop. He argued that that's an irremovable vagueness uh, in these truncated series, the best you can do. And the small exponential can enter only where it's smaller than this vagueness. And he did a calculation to show that this can happen, happens near what we now call Stokes lines. So uh, that's a very, a very clever argument. Uh, but we now understand things differently. We understand that the second exponential is born from the resummed divergent tail of the large uh, uh, exponential by a universal mechanism. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about. Now, this natural large variable is the difference between exponents and it's positive real on, uh, on, on, on a Stokes line. All the terms of the asymptotic series actually have the same phase. Right. And the least term is of the order of the magnitude of this f, which elsewhere it can be, compl it can be complex, but near a Stokes line it, it, it's real. So that's the least term. Um, now the asymptotics, you describe it this way. You have a series with uh, coefficients, factorial for large numbers, n, divided by the power, and you truncate it at the least term or near it, and, uh, and then you have the remainder. So you have the head and the divergent tail, which you have to understand. Good. Now the asymptotics of the asymptotics, the asymptotics is large F. The asymptotics is large N. What are the high order terms of this series? And there's a universality in them. Uh, and this was clearly understood, first of all, by uh, my PhD supervisor, Bob Dingle, who, whose work I didn't appreciate. I mean, I sort of noted it, but I didn't appreciate it till much later. And I was away from St. Andrews, where we were, uh, and, 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 and developed it in the ways I'm going to describe. So it's uh, here's Dingle. You'll see him several times. And here's Gaston Darbou. <laughs> I will explain the connection with him in a little while. And the result is that the tail is high order, so, uh, 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 um, sorry, I should say n much. No, no, here's the tail, it's the sum, uh, uh, because f is large, uh, is a factorial divided by a power with little shifts and some constants and whatever. Sometimes it's n over 2, it depends on details. But anyway, basically, always a factorial divided by a power. Actually, I can explain now why, 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 where this comes from. You see, these asymptotic series in physics come from approximation schemes. WKB, semi-classical, or um, uh, st steepest descent, stationary phase. And these are all local approximations. You start, for example, near, near a saddle point. The corrections come from expanding. But that means that the high corrections evolve derivatives of something. Because you more and more you expand your derivatives. And Darbu had shown that the high derivatives of something uh, at near a particular point of a function are determined by the nearest singularity to that point. Now, if that's a pole or a branch point, you differentiate number, and you naturally get factorials, and that's where they come from. And Dingle understood this and developed it in great detail. And that's a huge simplification. I mean, if, if ever you've calculated the, any of your non-trivial asymptotic series, you know that the terms get very, very complicated. And I want to illustrate that, um, copying something from Dingle's book. Here's an interval with saddle points. Um, here they are. F is large. G is some function. And the series uh, is a series involving um, some coefficients you have to calculate. And these involve the derivatives of F and G. Well, uh, here's the eighth term there. So, you see, it's very complicated. And the fact that this is approximated by one term involving factorial over a power, and you check it numerically, is an extreme simplification, and especially since that factorialness is universal, whereas the details are, are of course, not universal. It depends on the particular derivatives of, of, of the functions involved. Good. So, the, And as I said, the underlying phenomenon is this universality at high derivatives. And I'm just going to mention in passing that uh, something that I uh, d d discovered uh, a long time ago, that although these hydrogens are factorially big, what they multiply is the attractor of the map of high derivatives, increasing derivatives, and basically 
every function, when you differentiate it enough times, looks like cos x. This is surprising. It should be in mathematics books, whatever. And I discovered it uh, uh, well, well, in, 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 by looking at the corrections to the geometric phase. Uh, when, soon after I'd found it, uh, it was an approximation. You find the group, and I realised that this uh, universal cosine, up to shift and um, and scale, is uh, at, the, at the heart of it. And then much later, I wrote about it with, with details. Uh, it, it demonstrating in a great variety of cases exactly where these oscillations come from. And to my surprise, it was used by people uh, who did experiments on electron tunnelling statistics. They were looking at high moments or cumulants of tunnelling statistics. And of course, cumulants or high moments, moments are derivatives of a generating function. So, you know, it fitted naturally. And I was surprised to discover that. Anyway, enough of that. Now, the asymptotics of the asymptotics of the asymptotics, right? Uh, we have large f, we have large n, we, where we truncate, and we want to evaluate the sum, but we want to do it near a Stokes line. We've got to read some of it because we want to understand what Stokes thought was a discontinuity can't really be because the function is smooth. And we do this, you use Borel summation. Now, just to t say so, Borel summation is a well-known technique uh, in which uh, you have a divergent um, uh, uh, series, you have a factorial times some coefficients. You replace the factorial by its integral. It's, you have to worry about the legitimacy, or, or actually not worry, but if you're a physicist. Um, and then you, you, you tame the factorial because it becomes a power, and you can then often sum the series. Now, that works very nicely. It's commonly used away from a Stokes line. But on a Stokes line, Traditionally, people say that the series is not Borel summable. Well, that's a mistake. It is Borel summable. You have to do it right. And uh, the idea is to approximate this universal divergent series across a Stokes line. So F is, uh, is near the real axis, and you see what happens. So there's a result for that. I'm not going to derive it, but I'll tell you about it. Then you learn that a small exponential is born not suddenly, but smoothly according to a universal scaling in terms of uh, an error function. Now here, I'll just illustrate it. Here's Airy. Subtract off the um, leading uh, exponential down to its uh, smallest term, best you can do. That's something big, something big, and outside is the exponential, also big. Right, and then it turns out you get something small, and what is it? It's universal, it's, it's an error function, the one plus it describes it. And what is this sigma? It's this universal scaling variable, and it's the imaginary part you're crossing from negative to positive, divided by square root of twice the real part. And I want to illustrate that, you see, for the airy function. Uh, here's two cases, f equals 3, f equals 10, and you've got the exact and the approximate, the theory. Well, you see it works well and better the higher you go. There's also the imaginary part of this thing, but that gets smaller as you go. So the disparity there is 22,000 for the n case, and hidden away is this thing of order one, which is this smooth, um, this smooth uh, uh, exponential. Very good. It's the error function in the airy function. Well, there's a wide variety of applications in mathematics. Uh, the error function, Bessel functions, hypergeometric functions, gamma functions, even the error function itself has the, uh, the Stokes phenomenon in it. Integrals with coalescing saddles, Riemann zeta function, ma many, many cases. And in physics, it's been applied to refraction of waves by refractive index gradient, particle pair creation, polarization sensitivity in a twisted crystal, Aronoff bohm wave function, and I'll talk about now quantum transitions. So this is the first application. You want to know the history of a, tra of a quantum transition induced by a slowly changing Hamiltonian. Now you know that if you have a quantum state, let's say two components, it's enough. Each have their amplitudes evolving uh, exponentially, and they have their phases. Um, the system starts in one of the eigenstates and adiabatically remains close to the instantaneous evolving states as time proceeds. And uh, that's represented by the component with the dominant exponential. The subdominant exponential represents the component that's jumped to the other state. And it's known, uh, it was known in the 1930s, Landau, Zena, Majorana, in a particular model, and in the 1950s by the Russian 
physicists, including Dickney, that uh, it's m much more general, that uh, the f at the end, uh, the Hamiltonian has stopped changing, the, the component that's in the state you didn't start from is exponentially small. So my question was, well, how does this arise? You start with zero and you start end up with exponentially small. What's the history of it? Well, the transition happens in, as the real time crosses a Stokes line originating in a complex time degeneracy. Now, the details depend sensitively on which basis the states are represented in. You see, you can represent the states in an instantaneous basis or a WKB correction or correction or correction, depending. And the behavior of the state that you don't um, that you don't start out in uh, evolution it depends very much and sensitively on uh, uh, on, on, uh, on which basis you use. Now I'm going to illustrate that, showing pictures of the transition amplitude for two a function of time for two different slowly changing Hamiltonians. It doesn't matter what they are. Um, in both cases, I've chosen the sort of epsilon. That's the slowness such that the transition probability is uh, what I've shown here, and it corresponds to optimal truncation at the fifth term. So here's, if you just stop at the leading term, okay, kth term, k is zero, here's time, here's the, here's the, um, the, the, the error function, you end up at this small exponential after a long, but in between you have these enormous variations, still small, root epsilon, but much bigger than, much bigger than, uh, uh, bigger than uh, exponential. Well, uh, suppose you include one correction term. Well, you've immediately brought this down from 0.08 to 0.01, so that's already a big improvement. You, you want to make the transition as smooth as possible. And then k equals 2, k equals 3, k equals 4, k equals 5. This is optimal. There are some wiggles which we understand, but that's, uh, they go away if, 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 if epsilon is smaller. But if you go beyond, you, you lose it. So the smoothest possible transition is if you stop at the least term and then, and then look at the evolution of the, uh, of the component that, um, that, uh, uh, that is appearing, the, 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 the corresponding to the transition. So, um, so that's an application of, uh, of, of this Stokes smoothing. It tells you the most effective basis to use in order to make quantum transitions happen in the smoothest way. And, and of course, uh, this is physics, because uh, you can implement, for example, in neutron, uh, neutron uh, in NMR, you, you can, um, uh, by changing the magnetic field, you can implement these different bases and measure in them. And so it's, it's physics, it's not just mathematics. Right, now, in mathematics literature, until a few decades ago, uh, asymptotic series were defined according to a prescription by Poincaré. Now, Poincaré is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, but this was a bad step. He made a, f a, a mistaken step. He defined asymptotic series by saying, you stop at some term, like the third, and then the remainder is uh, epsilon or one on f uh, to, 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 to the third or the fourth, whatever. So, well, now, in fact, there are two disadvantages in this for our purposes. You can't capture exponentially small terms because for exponentially small terms, you have to stop at an order that isn't fixed. It depends on your large parameter, as I've said. More seriously, uh, it doesn't. Uh, this prescription doesn't distinguish between convergent and divergent series, so it's really not appropriate for our purposes. Right. Now, superasymptotics. That's summing to the least term. Stokes and then resumming a bit, that's beyond. So this is the, the first stage, what I've described. It captures small exponentials. Uh, Martin Kruskal liked to use the expression asymptotics beyond all orders. Right. Um, now, hyperasymptotics, which I'm going to spend the rest of the time on, goes beyond. It's a repeated resummation based on the principle of resurgence. That's a very much used term nowadays in various areas of mathematical physics. Um, the idea, it was discovered by Dingle in the 1960s. Here he is again. And uh, s discovered independently by John Eckhall in the 1980s. And he used the term resurgence. And 
He embedded it in much more deeper general mathematical frameworks, but as you might expect from a pure mathematician, it wasn't accompanied, it wasn't used to develop ways of getting ever more precise approximations, which Dingle had already anticipated in the 1960s. Now I'm going to describe that and how we've gone beyond now. And it's this simple idea. Series don't diverge for no reason. The divergence of a series must reflect its cause. And what is its cause? Well, we're talking about exponentials with series multiplying them, but there are other exponentials that aren't captured by this first uh, series. And so the cause of the divergence of a series is the fact there are other exponentials which have their series as well. And uh, it must diverge the series in order to accommodate them. More generally, each component series, and functions can have more than two, Airy just has two, must contain, coded into its high orders, information about all the other exponentials in terms of their series that multiply them. Now, that's a very deep thing, and Dingle had an explicit form. Here it is when there are only two exponentials. So you have this series, something divided by, uh, by, by powers, and these coefficients, what are they? Well, as I said, they're factorials, but that's only the first term. The factorial multiplies the least term, and uh, oh, sorry, the lowest order, but then there are corrections to the high orders corresponding to the first correction, the second correction, the third correction. So it's a very deep thing. And as I say, Dingle uh, discovered it, but it was rediscovered actually a number of times. Um, now, hyperasymptotics is this. You have this sum, and you represent it as a series of series. Primitive asymptotics, often good enough for many purposes, you just take A0. Superasymptotics is you sum to the least term. Then you can get an integral representation in many cases for the remainder. And you get an asymptotic series for that, which you sum to its least term, and that gives you S1, the first uh, correction, and then an asymptotic series for its remainder, uh, another integral, and that's, uh, uh, that's S2, and so on. Now, I want to illustrate that with, again with the airy function. I'll give you a different uh, example later. So I've chosen F equals 16. Okay, the thing uh, minus 16. So I'm looking on the dark side, right, small exponential. And the uh, area function has order z, its variable is z point something. Good. Well, here we are. We're looking at the logarithm, ten, uh, base 10 logarithm of the terms. Well, here you go. You decrease, decrease to the least term. Uh, that's the zeroth stage. And then you've reached superasymptotics. Then you stop, but you resum the tail, and you get the first stage, a hyperseries, the second stage, the third stage. These series get smaller. You don't get a convergent series this way, but still you get a huge improvement. You see you go from uh, from about uh, 10 to the minus 2 of the first term to super asymptotics, 10 to the minus 6 or 7. And then uh, um, you go down all the way here and you get to about 10 to the minus 18. This is for the area function of a relatively small uh, variable. Okay, so there we are. So, as I said, the optimally truncated terms get shorter. Roughly, each one is half as long as a predecessor. There's, there's more subtlety with, with that. Now, this is a simple case. For more general uh, situations, I mean, let's talk about integrals with a number of saddle points. Um, that's a, a very common situation in, in, in physics, and sometimes these other saddle points, uh, than the one that your contour is going through, are... Um, uh, they're called, uh, sometimes they're called instantons. It, it, the terminology varies with the particular subculture of mathematical physics they appear in. So here's an integral through a particular saddle. Call that the basic saddle. Then there's a topological concept. There are saddles adjacent to this one. And what does that mean? Well, it means this. You change the phase of your large parameter, and then the contour, steepest ascent contour changes, and as you do that, you will hit other saddles. These are the adjacent saddles. And then there are ones that are not adjacent that you don't hit, but they will appear as you go to more um, successive stages of hyperasymptotics. You gradually bring in more and more of them. OK. So here's an integral going through the uh, nth saddle. 
uh, and and k is uh, is the large parameter, and it has a phase. So you go through the nth saddle, and the, and and, and the, the steepest descent path depends on the phase of your large parameter. Good. Now. You, you tidy this up a bit, you, you pull out the leading order exponential, and then you get uh, uh, this reduced function that you want to understand. Right. Now, there's this formal expansion that I've been speaking about. It involves more and more derivatives. Uh, and these are the coefficients of order r. OK. And they're divided by coefficients in the series in inverse powers of, uh, of the large parameter. Good. And the leading order, it simply involves a second derivative and, and the value of g at the saddle. Good. Now, there's an exact resurgence relation for the tail, and you get it exactly by manipulating the, the integral. I won't describe uh, how we did that. So what is it? Well, you take the terms of this series, you stop at the least term. Actually, you can stop anywhere. This is exact still. And then what you get, the remainder is exactly a sum over all the other saddles, and an integral over the function corresponding to each of those other saddles with some stuff. And you can expand that. And uh, uh, these are the adjacent saddles. And uh, there's some little, or it depends, zero or, or one little, or it, uh, there's a sign there which comes from topology. And these differences between the exponent at your saddle and the exponent at the one that's contributing to the high orders, use Dingle's term, the singulant. It's a very useful terminology. OK. Now, if you then expand that integral using uh, steepest descent, you get this formal resurgence relation that uh, the high-order terms co of co contributions to the nth saddle, integral through the nth saddle point, is a sum over all the adjacent saddles, factorial over a power, and then these corrections. So that's a very general, beautiful uh, relation. And... Uh, the, for the late terms of the series of the nth saddle. And uh, these involve, as I say, the early terms, 0, 1, of the adjacent saddles. Now, if you iterate that, you get a hyper-series. And uh, uh, that's the result of this hyper-asymptotics. Um, so, the, um, you, 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 uh, you, 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 for example, a, a given saddle, call it the, zero, the zeroth saddle, OK? Then you have sums over all the other saddles and multiple sums, and at each stage, you've got certain integrals. And these are universal S-fold for the s hyper uh, integrals. We call them hyperterminants. Dingle introduced the term terminant for the first stage. Now, why is it that... Uh, what's the use of uh, approximating, representing an integral in terms of a series of more and more multiple integrals? The answer is that these integrals are, are universal. And doesn't matter what integrals you apply to, provided they have just simple saddles. By the way, if you have uh, integrals with coalescing saddles or integrals with a single saddle where the distant saddles may coalesce, we can deal with that. And Chris Howells and I have long, rather technical papers on how these series behave, but the principle is the same. And I want to illustrate this. Oh, sorry, and each of the series is about half the length of its predecessor. So the, th the theory stops after a logarithmic number of terms. Now, here's an example, the Piercy integral. X and Y, I've chosen X equals 7, Y is 1 plus I. It doesn't matter ooh, what, what you choose. And here are three saddles. So this is quartic, so there are three saddles. OK. Um, and hyperasymptotics generates a sequence of series from uh, scatterings between, uh, between these saddles in order to illustrate that. Again, these are the terms along the scattering paths, and these are the base 10 logarithms of the terms. And by the way, if instead of the terms you plot the errors, you get the same picture. So here you are, um, you're starting um, super asymptotics. You go to the least term. In this particular case, I, I can't remember I can't remember what the, what, what the order of the term is. It's, uh, well, I can, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Tenth order. Right. Then you have the two adjacent saddles. OK. In the case of Airy, there's only one adjacent saddle. It's the other one. You keep going back and forth. But here it's more complicated. Uh, you've got two paths to the two, each of the two adjacent saddles. And you, these give you contributions, which you include. Additive. 
Then there are two scatterings. Uh, when you come back again from each of those to your original adjacency, and then there are more, and then it sort of stops. And I'll just show you the numbers. Uh, in this. So in, in the very lowest order, the error, fractional error, is about uh, uh, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2. When you go to uh, super asymptotics, uh, you get much better. You get 10 to the minus 6. Stokes would have thought that's the best you can do. But then you go to this ultimate hyperasymptotics, you get 10 to the minus 12. And uh, then you can compare, of course, with the exact. And here you see the improvement in the green. You get better and better and better as you go through the different uh, layer levels. And this has been, this, uh, has been um, applied in a number of different cases. I mean, you can have intervals don't have saddles, but intervals where the dominant asymptotes come from endpoints. You know, there are many different cases, or poles, and a lot of different... Uh, cases in traditional asymptotics where all of these ideas apply mutatis mutandis with the different um, degrees of sophistication. Now that's a story I wanted to tell you. Now I want to celebrate three people, three in individuals. Um, and uh, uh, there's Dingle I've mentioned already several times. I think he was the deepest, I mean, because I think his contributions were the first real improvement since uh, since Stokes. And that's this is um, after this misdirection from Poincaré. Um, you know, mathematicians universally used in order to get error bounds, for example. But now error bounds that the mathematicians get are much more sophisticated because they use this idea of going to the least term and then repeated resummation. And someone who took that up was, was Frank Olver. Um, and he's specialist in special functions. And uh, you can see him holding the original Abramovitz and Stegen, where he computed the original chapter on Bessel functions, which is the most consulted chapter in that book. But then at the end of his life, he masterminded the Digital Library of Mathematical Functions, DLMF. And if you don't know it, Google DLMF. You will never open Abramovitz and Stegen again because it's so much more convenient. And I had the privilege of being the physics editor of, uh, of that uh, enterprise. It's a NIST enterprise because uh, uh, NIST is the descendant of the National Bureau of Standards who inspired the original. Um, Frank Olver was very sceptical. Um, when when uh, He was a referee of my, of my paper on the smoothing of the Stokes function. And uh, he knew Dingle and respected Dingle, but hadn't really uh, taken in what Dingle had done. And when he saw my little calculation, he, he rejected the paper and he said, uh, well, I've written so much about asymptotics of special functions, it must be in my papers somewhere. Well, it wasn't. And I convinced him that it wasn't, and I argued back, and then the paper was published, and he, he took it up very nicely. Then Martin Kruskal, he had encountered divergent series uh, in studying adiabatic invariance in plasma physics, in the work he did in the late 50s and, and early 60s. And, and he realized that these adiabatic invariants were, convert, were conserved to all orders. These were nonlinear differential equations, or asymptotics of some kind of slowness of changing parameters. And, uh, and, and, and he, he said, well, of course, they're not exact, so uh, uh, they must be, um, uh, you, must, you need asymptotics beyond all orders to, uh, to, uh, uh, to understand, understand that. Now, uh, and that's correct, and he and his colleagues in a number of different problems, also in fluid mechanics, were able to identify what the small exponentials were. It's, some, it's more difficult than doing that for... for um, for, uh, for, for simple integrals that I, that I had before. OK, now he had a different, another idea. He was a very imaginative person. He was much attracted by John Conway's surreal numbers. And uh, he had the idea that that way of representing numbers might be useful in making asymptotics rigorous from the beginning. Well. That didn't lead anywhere, and I don't think it was right. But he, Martin Kruskal was so clever that um, that uh, he deserved to, to be taken uh, seriously. Well, that was a situation at the end of the 1990s. But since then, in the 2000s, um, uh, oh no, there's a little bit more. Sorry, first of all, there's a weird connection with South East London. <laughs> I don't know why. Chris Howells pointed out that you see. Airy was the Astronomer Royal in Greenwich. 
Frank Olver himself, a master of special functions, came from Croydon in South London. Tom Piercy of the Cusp Piercy function came from Woolwich in South East London. And Chris Howells himself, my, my student and now a professor in, in Southampton, also was... I'm not part of this because I come from north of the river, so I'm different from, all, different from those characters. It's a kind of strange thing. It has no significance at all. But suddenly, in this century... Uh, sorry, I'm still not ready for that. I, I, forgive me, forgive me. What's the message? It's the legacy from Bayes, from Euler, Dingle Eckow, from Stokes insisting on understanding how the rainbow's dark side is connected to interference fringes on the bright side. The legacy was this, is this, that, this is my message, that divergent series are not meaningless, they're not a nuisance, they're an essential an informative coded representation of a function describing phenomena, you know, birth of small exponentials or, 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 or transitions or, or whatever. Now, in the 1990s and the 2000s now, that's what I'm saying, there's much new mathematics coming from these ideas. A number of excellent mathematicians have taken up these ideas in their different ways. And more importantly, in the 20s and the 20, 2000s and the 2020s, the resurgence, is, I'm using a, it's a pun of course, is a resurgence of interest in all this because of applications to non-perturbative quantum field theory and string theory. Now, the basic ideas are the same, but there are more sophisticated uh, 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 um, uh, ingredients which come in because of the fact that uh, you have infinitely many degrees of freedom in a field theory. So more complicated than the already rich structures of integrals with a finite number of variables. And uh, this started by Ed Witten, who was saying, well, you really... I mean, here's, our, here's our friend, of course, Simons, um, uh, from here, uh, saying that, well we really should look at the high orders of these field theories um, uh, because, uh, you know, we want to understand exponentially small... In physics, there are things like false vacua, instantons or whatever, and there's a whole culture now of uh, the developments, very technical. Uh, there's a meeting in Cambridge, England, at this very moment in the Isaac Newton Institute. There's a, a session on uh, resurgence which is a descendant of... A, 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 a session that Chris Howes and I organised in, in, in 1995, asymptotics, exponential asymptotics, and now it's developed and, and there are these other communities which are using it. I want to mention one thing. If you read Feynman's Nobel lecture, uh, there's one beautiful little comment because he, he was talking about QED, and QED is quite a good approximation. You take just a few terms because uh, the small parameter is one divided by 137. And he, he says, I have a feeling that you'd see something interesting if you could go to the 137th order. And of course, what he means is e to the minus 137. Nobody can calculate all those terms to, even to this day, but that it is there in, in the theory. So um, I've written a number of papers over the years on these things. They're all on my home page. I won't go into that. But uh, I hope it's, you've understood this story. I mean, divergent series are really interesting, beautiful things. And, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, so I'll stop. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, questions, comments, discussion? On silence, yeah. Now, now I'm going to come close to you because I said yesterday I don't hear very well and I want to hear your question. Yeah, Egal, and turn on your seat mic. Oh, yeah, oh, oh do that. Let's see. Yeah, where are you? Back, right, back to your right. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Uh, in a lot of these analyses, you knew the form of the, of the terms how they are behaving for large n. Yes. But usually we com compute one term at a time. Indeed. Thank you for that. Now, this all became very practical because, um, because of computer algebra. 
I mean, it was known, as you said, that uh, terms get uh, uh, get uh, uh, more and more complicated. You just can calculate a few. But once computer algebra came, particularly in my case, Mathematica, you can calculate many more of these terms than you used to be able to. And you can quickly identify, sometimes numerically, uh, I mean, if it's an integral, you know where the saddles are. So you know what the small exponential is. Uh, you still... If you implement this, you still have to compute the terms, but you know roughly what you're going to get. But sometimes you don't know. If, for example, for nonlinear equations, you often don't know. Uh, uh, you don't have a simple integral representation. And, for example, old, old Adri Dahlhouse, who was a student of, uh, uh, of Frank Olver, um, uh, he has used um, uh, numerics to identify. You converge on the coefficient of the small exponential. So it's a combination now. We use the the wonderful facility of, uh, of computer algebra uh, to calculate enough of these terms to identify the, 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 these behaviours. So thank you for that. Yeah. OK, other questions? Yeah. On silence, I see. Uh, Alex? Hi. Thanks for inspiring talk, as always. Sorry, Can you hear if, me? If you, um, uh, forgive me, but if you wear a mask, I won't understand you. Sure. It's, it's my defective hearing. Sure. Thank you. Could you comment on uh, numerical evaluation of special functions and uh, sort of where this fits into efficient evaluation mm. schemes? Mm. Because that's, it, it seems like, I mean, that's something we all care about here, of course, as, as computational people. Um, it seems like it can help you sometimes, but other times it's it's more uh, sort of digging into a function to understand it rather than actually. It's an you know, art. You know, computing it. it, it, but, it but it's, yeah, it Stokes it's, seems it's, like he wanted to compute good. things. The yes. whole history involves computation, but where does it fit into I'll computation tell you. now? So, so the answer is in a complicated way, uh, and this is a kind of craft or an art as much as a science. Now, in um, for example, in Mathematica, one of the attractions, and I'm sure other software too, but one of the attractions for uh, uh, practitioners like myself is that you can just call up special functions and anywhere in the complex plane. So how do they do it? Well, I, I don't know all of it, but I know some of it, some of the number theoretic functions, they use some of the asymptotics that we've developed for covering some of them. Otherwise, um, if it's integrals, well, I do this, actually, myself. If you want to calculate um, uh, some of the integrals involving os or, or with oscillatory uh, uh, argument, uh, then the way you do it in a, is you deform the contour into the complex plane so that things converge. And then, uh, and then there are various tricks, but that's the basis. And uh, you do Now, of course, that gets more and more difficult as the oscillation gets faster and faster, but it's optimal by... by moving the contour so that asymptotically uh, diverge. And that is good enough for the application in optics that, that, that we've done. Or for drawing, if you look at the digital library of mathematical functions, our chapter in 19, uh, in chapter 36, Chris, uh, integrals with coalescing saddles, we've got lots of pictures. And we generate all of those pictures by deforming contour in the complex plane and then using various integration routines that uh, sometimes you have to fiddle the integration technique and other times it, whatever comes naturally to Mathematica you don't need to change and there's a black art there because I mean there are so many different integration techniques that you can use and you experiment a bit with, with them but, that, but that's good enough um, I suspect that what is done when you just call up a function in that same and, you, and uh, you, you don't specify a technique that what is going on behind the scenes is a hybrid, actually. I mean, sometimes it's like airy, exactly airy. You, you can sometimes there's a convergence series. Sometimes you go to Stokes and use asymptotics. So I think it's a hybrid. Now, although the claim is that you can identify, you can calculate these special ones with arbitrary precision, it, you can't always, actually. Uh, uh, it's surprising that often you can. Uh, but there are special, M4, for example, the continued fractions that represent these functions. So I don't know what the people in Mathematica or, or other software actually do. But um, in the Digital Library of Mathematical Functions, at the end of each chapter, there are references to uh, papers where 
you can read about the numerical evaluation of the functions that are described. And it, as I say, it's, it's an art and a craft, but it's, but it's not, uh, but it's rational. <laughs> okay. Does that, I'm sorry, I can't say better, but does that make sense? Would you agree that then numerical steepest descent, which I think is an underappreciated tool, yeah. means you can, if you know the saddle point, you can go through with a, a contour integral Yes. And then you don't have to do any algebra at all. No, I know. I, that's so then you said. bypass. And, and, and you that's what we do. To, bypass the algebra. And, and that's what we do. But there's, the, but there, the, there are two things. You know, you can calculate something numerically, or you can, uh, and you also want to understand it. So and that's a different type of uh, a, a different. It depends exactly on what science you're doing at the time. So both are uh, important. And this, what you describe, is exactly what we do. I mean, we, we you know, there's other methods. For example, um, John Connor. A, 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 a theoretical chemist, one of, one of the methods that they use is they find a differential equation satisfied by the way. You can't always find that, but with special functions you usually can. And then you use, you use ODE routines. Well, I personally find that the contraindical method is, that you're mentioning, numerical, so is better. But, uh, you know, again, there are different opinions about it. Yeah. It is fun, though. I mean, it's lovely to see these numbers coming out and making sense. But the sense comes from the kind of asymptotics I was describing. Yeah. So other questions? All right, let me ask a quick, uh, totally ignorant question. So one sees, oh, sorry. Uh, one sees a lot of, uh, th there has been a lot of discussion, particularly in the context of uh, um, physics and its intersection with certain areas of mathematics about dualities and theories that are dual one to the other. And duality loosely means relating a weak coupling or small argument behavior of one theory to a large argument behavior of another theory. And things like instantons which occur as asymptotic expansions in one theory to weak coupling phenomena in another. So does all the, the stuff that you presented in the second part of your talk, the hyperasymptotics and so on, change how we think about that? Does it add new particles, new something to the duality discussion? I can say something about that. I mean, it's sort of related, but uh, there's something actually deeper, and I just give me, give, give me the excuse to speak about it. Um, underlying a lot of duality is the Poisson summation formula or its various generalizations. And what that does, it transforms a sum into another sum. And they often converge uh, in opposite, in dual regimes. The simplest case are the theta functions. Okay. Now, there's physics in this, and I've used this half a dozen times in, 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 in my scientific life, in different areas of physics, actually. And, but the underlying is the following. What the Poisson summation formula does in physics, it takes a sum over eigenvalues, for example, in the Harnoff Bohm effect, angular momenta, it's a sum, into another sum over topologies. And in the case of uh, Harnoff Bohm, it's windings around the, the flux line. That's just one example of, uh, as I say, half a dozen in different areas of physics. And so that exactly encompasses the kind of duality you're speaking about. And then there are more and more sophisticated versions. But I, I think that's the heart of it. And I learned this, actually, first of all, um, uh, by, by, uh, from a paper, I don't know how I encountered it, but by um, C.L. Pecoris in the 1940s, very brilliant uh, Israeli um, uh, theory, mathematical scientist, I'll put it more he made the first... Uh, um, uh, a digital computer in Israel. It's called Weizsack. You can see it in a, in a glass case. on And he used it to uh, the calculation on, asymp uh, on oceanography. But he was talking about waveguides. And he said, well, uh, you, you, you have a, a signal going down a waveguide. You can write it as sum over the waveguide modes. But you can also write it as a sum over classical paths that bounce a number of times across the side of the waveguide. That's the topology. And I realized that, when I, that that must be something general. And as I say, I've used it a, a lot. So that's my comment about, about your question. I don't know if it's helpful. Yeah. 